and greetings in the name of our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome us to our weekly program from the Intercessors for Kenya Ministries. My name is Collins Namachanja and our topic for discussion or our teaching today is um, on deliverance from faulty foundations and bondages. Welcome. Uh, two lesson objectives as we start off. The first one is for us as believers to gain an understanding of the nature of foundations and bondages. And secondly, to help believers deal with faulty foundations and find release from bondages so that they fulfill their full potential in the Lord Jesus Christ. I find it apt to begin our teaching with a quote from Sun Tzu, The Art of War, from um, a Chinese classic, actually. It says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Foundations and bondages, especially the area of foundations, is one area of our spiritual walk that is often ignored and never taken into serious account or considerations by a number of believers. And so the relevance of the past, uh, the foundations and roots of the believer's past are deemed pretty of no serious consequence. But the key point and the key emphasis from our discussion today is that a believer's past has relevance to his spiritual work. The foundation upon which a believer's life is best is significant. In the words of Prophet Hosea, God's people perish or are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. This verse is, is, is wide, actually, and it tells us that if you reject knowledge, you refuse to know things, then ultimately it has a direct bearing on what the Lord will do or will not do with you as a believer. So we are destroyed because we do not know the strategies of the enemy. We are destroyed because we ignore the enemy. We are destroyed because we have a wrong theology and that very wrong theology we apply it selectively. And so because of that, then God in turn rejects us from being his priests. We are all familiar with foundations and the basic definitions of foundation. The basis upon which something stands or upon which something is supported. That part of a structure or institution, organization, or even movement that is not seen or easily appreciated, yet it is of paramount importance in determining the life, health, growth, and development of the entity that is under consideration. Foundation can also be interchanged with the word root. The root defined as the underground part of a flowering plant or a plant that usually anchors and supports it, or something that is an underlying cause or basis, for example, of a condition or quality. 
So when we say faulty foundations, then in itself connotes that there are foundations that are proper, that are well laid or that are well constructed. This is clearly demonstrated by the Lord himself um, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, where he contrasts uh, two scenarios where one builds upon a solid rock and the other one on sand. The man who hears the word and obeys is likened to one who built his house on a solid rock that was able to withstand the rains, the floods, and the winds. This is akin to a godly foundation. We can therefore say that godly foundations are established when the word of God is a bedrock or is a structure upon which an individual's life his marriage, his businesses, is built upon. Indeed, uh, from scripture, it is an established principle that God's blessings flow to those individuals or institutions or even nations that are built upon the word of God. See, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. It says, And if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessings that overcome, blessings that overtake, are embedded in a life of obedience to the word of the Lord. The converse then is true when it comes to faulty foundations. So these are established when our lives are based upon other principles other than the word of God. So humanistic philosophies, intellectualism and other isms, if they are the bedrock of your life, then surely your life is based upon, or is based upon a faulty foundation. These are they that the Lord says build their houses upon sand. And the house here, by the way, can mean any structure, uh, life, marriage, or business. So when the rains come, and, and the floods, and the winds, such houses cannot stand. They fall, and the word says, great is their fall. This then calls us to examine the foundations upon which our lives are best. Now, some biblical examples on the question of foundations. The picture of the effect of foundations and roots is clearly portrayed in scripture right from the book of Genesis. We know the story of Cain and Abel, or shall I say Cain and Seth for our purposes today. Cain became a murderer and introduced into the foundations of his lineage the spirit of murder. We read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 to 24, that Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Then Cain bore Enoch, and to Enoch was born Erad. Erad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael the father of Methushael. And Methushael, the father of Lamech. Lamech married two wives, Ada and Zillah. Then we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. It seems then that Lamech was aware of this curse running through the family and he traces it all the way back to his ancestor Cain. You will remember from 
the Bible that Cain was cast to be a fugitive and a wanderer away from the presence of the Lord. And generations down the line, his lineage is captive of the spirit of murder and the curse. And rather than seeking to break it, we see Lamech here is content to invoke the pronouncement of vengeance God promised Cain, should anyone attack him to kill him. So that his focus was to tap into the, the, the promise of protection that the Lord gave Cain to protect him so that no one could kill him. That's what Lamech was keen on. But the curse and the spirit of murder continue to run through. Now, contrast Cain's lineage with that of Seth. In Genesis 4, 25 to 26, we read, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. At the time of Seth, with his spiritually significant name, men began calling upon the Lord. Again, just reminding us of the significance of the names, the names we give to our children. So, men began to call on the name of the Lord at the time of Seth. Seth's lineage follows in Genesis chapter 5, and it covers Enoch, who walked with God for 300 years, and it flows down to Noah, and all the way to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Cross-check in Luke chapter 3, 23 to 37. So from Seth, the lineage flows all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessing and curse contrasted in both Cain and Seth. When then we talk of bondages, these are also referred to as negative patterns. The word bondage gives the sense of one who is under control of some demonic forces and therefore he finds it very difficult to overcome the patterns that they see in their lives. It's key for us as fathers to know and to remember that whatever fathers allow in the family becomes the ruling factor of the entire family and the generations to come. So then for our purposes today, our deliverance means rebuilding godly foundations and rewriting our family history through godly practices for total deliverance and freedom then we must look at the foundations on which our lives are built god will allow only a measure of prosperity which your foundation can carry and it's a principle that runs through normal day-to-day -day construction in the construction industry, whatever is built on top of foundation is measured according to the weight that that foundation can hold. Witchcraft is attacking you because that spirit of witchcraft identifies with what is in your foundation. So spiritual foundations are acts which invite spiritual interactions and interventions. Evil acts call for judgment, and righteous acts call for goodness and reward. As spiritual beings, I think it's key for us to remember that time was created for us. And so in the spiritual realm, time and distance have no basic consideration. Time does not exist in the spiritual realm. So whatever is done in life, in our lives remains alive regardless of when and where it was done. The evils of our ancestors then are alive even today. So if we do not deal with them, then they continue. 
on the issue of character and personality our fathers passed to us their personalities and character families and households are known by certain characters i'm sure we all know this back in the village or even in our neighborhoods you know a particular family is known for a particular character these characters flow from one generation to another so we understand for example that particular uh, families are mean or particular families are givers that has an indication of what their roots look like taking an example of moses here moses was from the tribe of levi exodus chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 says now a man from the house of levi took went and took to wife a daughter of levi the woman conceived and bore a son and when she saw that he was a goodly child she hid him three months so what levi received from his father he passed it on to his son moses and later on whatever the father passed on to his son moses became a big challenge to moses in his fulfillment of a prophetic destiny genesis chapter 49 verse 5 to 7 says simeon and levi are brothers weapons of violence and their swords oh my soul come not into their counsel oh my spirit be not joined to their company for in their anger they slay men and in their wantonness they hamstring oxen cast be their anger for it is fierce and their wrath for it is cruel i will divide them in jacob and scatter them in israel levi's problem was anger and because of that their father pronounced a curse on their anger and said he will scatter them in israel and for real when the land was allotted levi got no specific portion he was scattered all over the the, the, the land of israel and then for simeon simeon was hedged by judah he was given an allotment inside judah so literally they were scattered because of the anger you remember in genesis chapter 34 that these two brothers are the same ones who avenged their sister's rape by shechem the son of hamor the hevite they are the ones who hatched a very deceptive plan, got the males to be circumcised. Then three days later, when they were so, they attacked them, their anger. And so, because of that anger, they earned a curse from their father, Jacob. So literally, when we consider Moses, we can say a man from the tribe of anger married a woman from the tribe of anger. And they gave birth to a son of anger. And it showed in Moses' life. He killed an Egyptian in anger and went into exile for 40 years. Later, he's leading Israel through the desert. And then they make him angry so much that he struck the rock instead of speaking to it as the Lord had commanded. And that cost him entry into the promised land. You'll find this in Numbers 20. 6 to 12. Again, in anger, he broke the Ten Commandments so that the tablet, tablet upon which God himself had chiseled the commandments, Moses broke it. And because of that, he had to do another 40 days and 40 nights before the Lord in order to get a duplicate set, which he now had to chisel himself. For Moses, it was the curse of anger. Solomon was adultery from his father David. Isaac was the lying of his father Abraham. I always marvel at this particular one. It's exactly the same lie that the father told. Isaac comes to do the same. So for you, what have you carried in you from your father's house? Let's ponder here probably an argument in some christian circles that i call a contrary view second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 
has been used for the argument that salvation brings forth a new creation that is whole and does not require deliverance. Or that there is no need to deal with issues of foundations at family or individual level. I think people who argue about this are not, shall I say, interested in going further to discover what the rest of scripture says and what is required of them in walking or working out their salvation in fear and trembling as Paul puts it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 we read, since we have these promises beloved let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit and make holiness perfect in the fear of God. This would seem to imply that a believer still has some work to do in cleansing himself from anything in his life that will defile him and keep him from attaining perfection in holiness. Be sure and settle in your understanding that God visits the sins of the ancestors to the third and fourth generation, especially as far as the sin of iniquity or idolatry is concerned. Exodus 24 to 5 says, You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Also, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 6 to 7 says, Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. Yeah? I will repay into their bosom their iniquities and their father's iniquities together, says the Lord, because they burned incense upon the mountains and reviled me upon the hills. I will measure into their bosom payment for their former doings. I think the new birth for us as believers simply empowers us to be able to deal with things of the past. Let's look at the characteristics of bondages. To help you identify bondages in your life, see if your life can be distracted in any one of these ways. I seem to move one step forward, then two backwards. My life seems to move in circles, but not forward. Bad things always happen to me. Certain things like poverty, illness, marriage breakdown happen to my parents and they are now happening to me. I cannot change. It has been like this for years. Everyone has talked to me and it has not helped. That is the way I was brought up. I know my people. This thing is in our family. Whatever I do or not do makes no difference. If you can relate to any of these statements, probably you need to consider your life and the foundations upon which it is best. Some facts about bondages. A spiritual bondage is marked by a series of negative incidences that occur in your life or family. And, and, and then they form a pattern or a cycle or an annual pattern. For example, every year at a specific month, such and such a thing occurs. Or the pattern affects the people of a certain gender or age group in your family or village, such as all men in the family are drunkards, or all the women in the family do not get children. Such a cycle can be of a family, a tribe, or a nation and it will continue until it is broken it always takes the person of the family back to point zero let's then consider signs of bondages in one's life or family 
please remember that for these things to qualify as a bondage, they must not be isolated cases, but must be present themselves in several members of the extended family. Again, remember that not every misfortune that comes is a sign or is a bondage. Many things happen to us from natural causes, natural disasters or natural phenomena. So let's look at some of these things. One, chronic financial problems. You encounter an ending poverty and lack. Constant loss of jobs, unexplained constant loss of money, mishandling money, unexplained business failures. You've done everything, but your business fails. Unfruitful hands, you put yourself to labor, you work, but there's no fruit as a result of your labor. Then you suffer near success syndrome, the prevalence of hope or fulfillment, which is never realized because of unforeseen disruptions of this hope. You put everything together, you've planted, and everything looks like you're gonna have a bumper harvest, then something happens. Just when you're about to harvest, and the harvest goes. You have chronic debt and indebtedness. You live from hand to mouth. You impulsively turn to lenders to borrow so that you can meet your daily basic needs. Secondly, chronic sicknesses and diseases. You have long, frequent occurrence of diseases that vex. They weaken and bring trouble in the family. For example, where someone is always sick in the family, this one recovers, another one picks up, so it's, it's a continuous cycle, and then you get vexed as a family. There's always serious illness that you are encountering as a family. You have inherited sickness or cyclic sickness that does not respond to treatment. This may include uh, diseases of depression and alcoholism that run through the family. Thirdly, reproductive problems. Being unable to conceive and produce children even when there's no medical problem. Barrenness, miscarriages, and related reproductive problems that are widespread in the family. Mostly, the devil uses this one to capture us. Two, three, four years, no baby in the family, and you'll get the wise ones telling you you need to see someone. And unfortunately, we normal succumb. Number four, accident prone. An inclination to accidents at a high frequency where most family members have been involved in serious accidents. I think we can relate to this. At times, these follow a pattern and occur at the same place at the same or in the same season. Number five, marital problems. You have a history of separation and divorce in the family line. Constant arguing, fighting, quarreling, or a history of single parenthood. Marital ilegibility, a history of spinisters and bachelors in the family. But again here we need to remember that not everyone is called to marry, as some are called to serve God single. Now, so here we are only addressing cases that are due to spiritual blockage as a result of family sins. Number six is mistreatment and abuse by other people. Sexual abuse, verbal attacks, mental and physical abuse or rejection. Being a victim of incest and rape or being the perpetrator, rape by demons, victimization, you become a victim of cruelty, whether you neither experience favor nor mercy, you constantly in the place of work or even in the family suffer from false accusations. Personally, I, I have seen that where one has suffered sexual abuse of any form, that particular individual then becomes open to repeated attacks um, in their life um, unless um, the, the, the issue is addressed uh, and solved. Number seven, premature death. A history of gruesome death such as suicides or fires or floods, drowning, even car accidents that occur in patterns and cycles. Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse 17 
gives the concept of, of, of uh, dying prematurely, dying before your time. It says, be not wicked of much, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Proverbs chapter 2 verse 22 says, But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous shall be uprooted and removed from it. This shows the act of judgment upon the wicked by God, an act of cutting off, removal, before maturity, so to speak. And then chapter, Psalms chapter 37 verse 28, For the Lord delights in justice, and does not abandon his saints. This shows how God protects them, those he loves. Number eight, mental problems. Deuteronomy 28, 28 shows that God can punish people with confusion of mind because of their sins. He can punish them with insanity, confusion, mental and nervous breakdown, deep depression, schizophrenia, and related conditions. The nine, unnatural fear. The tendency to be terrified and completely paralyzed by a feeling of deep anxiety without cause. Extreme and unusual phobias, including fear of illness and death. I hope you have not, um, COVID-19 has not ushered you into this unnatural fear. Otherwise, the enemy will take advantage and uh, plant it in your life. 10. Demonic dreams. Recurrent dreams of being chased by people or animals, being strangled, falling endlessly, being forced to eat unclean food, being sexually molested, beaten or forced to work as a slave, flying in the air at night, being taken to different places. Examine that. Then 11. Vagabond beggars. Psalm 109 verse 10 says, May his children wander about and beg. May they be driven out of the ruins they inhabit. Here they are called wandering beggars or wandering children, not able to settle in life, trotting all over the land from city to city, job to job, relationship to relationship, house to house, never on track or ever having a sense of direction experiencing poverty and begging through and through wandering children or vagabond beggars we then need to remember again that when where we have these bondages it is evidence of faulty foundations negative patterns or bondages are evidence of a faulty foundation or roots. This then means that you must look for that root cause or seek to establish the reason behind the faulty foundation. The root cause of bondages is presented in the Bible as sin. Sin will give rise to a faulty foundation and bear the fruit of bondages. In Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 8, God ties his promises to obedience. And then in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, God has his assurance of curses for disobedience. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. The blessings will come upon you and overtake you. Similarly, the curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Imagine being overcome and overtaken by curses in your life. In Leviticus chapter 20, God describes the sins he will punish for several generations. Then in the same chapter, verse 5, he says, Then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut them off from among their people, him and all who follow him. Then remember 
in first samuel chapter 3 13 to 14 god says of eli's sin and i tell him that i am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons are blaspheming god and he did not restrain them therefore i swear to the house of eli that the iniquity of eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever that's what the lord says so our foundations are key and also obedience to the word of the lord is key let's look at the nature the nature of foundations a foundation is a single most important part of a building yet it is not normally visible or easily appreciated a faulty foundation would necessarily mean that it will not be long before the building collapses now when a building is raised on a faulty foundation the only alternative is to pull it down and raise a new one with proper foundations so if your life the building of your life is founded on a faulty foundation the remedy is to pull it down and raise a new one with a proper foundation so when you realize that your life is built on faulty foundations you have no choice but to pull it down and raise a right one this time founded on the eternal rock the lord jesus christ himself psalm 82 verse 5 says they have neither knowledge nor understanding they walk about in darkness all the foundations of the earth are shaken then psalms 11 3 says if the foundations are destroyed what can the righteous do the root of a problem as i repeat again is its foundation so from these two readings we learn that one foundations are hidden they cannot be seen at surface level but what appears on the surface always reveals the foundation secondly you cannot run away from your foundation the consequences of wrong foundations will affect your life and continue to do so until you address the cause and then three foundations can be inherited your character traits your manners your belief systems even responses to grace your response to salvation to holy living and attitude of life are part of the things you inherited from your fathers jeremiah 16 19 says "O oh lord my strength and my stronghold my refuge in the day of trouble to thee shall all the nations come from the ends of the earth and say our fathers have inherited not but lies worthless things in which there is no profit we inherit things from our fathers number four foundations can be destroyed it's easier to destroy a foundation than to build one this follows the principle of sowing and reaping in galatians chapter 6 verse 7 to 8 and then five no other foundation can supersede that of the lord jesus christ but the lord will not accommodate your idolatrous foundations he will not tolerate them so you need to get rid of them types of foundations one we have spiritual foundations which refer to the inherited spiritual roots and early spiritual exposures anyone has so this can be godly christian truths imparted by christian grandparents to one generation after another or satanic foundations imparted through satanic practices by grandparents uh, to the next generation i think most of us in africa we've inherited satanic foundations then we have prophetic foundations a clear example is in G, given in genesis chapter 49 what is spoken over your life prophetically will come to pass when the word is correctly spoken over you from the lord or by a spiritual father 
it will come to pass. Genesis 49, which I alluded to earlier in the context of Simeon and Levi, what their father spoke over them, it came to pass. Then three marital foundations. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 says, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. Marriage is a covenant sustained by love and faithfulness and must have God as its bedrock. Wrong foundations such as witchcraft and godly dowry negotiations, including sacrifices offered uh, during those very same negotiations and the ceremony itself, they tend to bring serious problems into marriages. And then we have, fourthly, the foundation of the church is Christ himself. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 to 22. So that then invites us to build our lives and our ministries upon Christ, who is our spiritual foundation. If we do so, we will never go wrong. Our lives will never go wrong. Our ministries will never go wrong. That is the same foundation upon which the apostles built. Let's have a, a closer look at the marriage foundation in the context of what constitutes an evil foundation in marriage. It's clear and true that some people go to idols to seek for marriage partners. Sacrifices are then made with satanic tokens that are used to manipulate and match two people who are otherwise incompatible into a marriage relationship. And so when that happens, that marriage is composed of uh, two people who are strangers to one another. Uh, some people, some men, get married using objects. You go to some uh, magician, he gives you some uh, talisman, and you go waving it around to a particular girl you want, so she'll follow you. Others enter into illegitimate relationships based on some love nuts. You're given a nut, you use it. And, and, and so for this, then, their marriages are dedicated by deities, by, 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 by others, extended family members, under very highly occultic traditions, eh? um, with ceremonies uh, accompanying that, including sacrifices to, to demons in order to invoke the blessings. Uh, of the dead for, for the couples, for the marriage. And then, at least we still do it today. There are couples who have desired to honor African traditions in their marriages, have been compelled to enter into some blood covenants, such as pouring out libations to their dead ancestors, their idea being to include such dead relatives into their ceremonies and therefore to gain their consent. Sooner or later, those marriages are affected by this covenant. There have been cases where <coughs> marriages have taken place by the graveside um, in order to invoke the blessing, say, of the father's, uh, uh, the girl's father who has passed, so that he can also be allowed to, to, to participate in the ceremony. Others have been made to lie prostrate on the grave and pouring libations and offerings um, in order to invoke those blessings. Unfortunately, some of us Christians have agreed to these diabolical traditional marriage ceremonies and thereby laying a faulty foundation for our marriages. Be assured you do this, Satan will follow your marriage and bring many, many untold difficulties and sufferings. And by the way, some of these ceremonies and negotiations, uh, the language used and the approach taken is, is very convincing. For example, you'll be told, well, if you take this piece of meat or, or the blood and you share it is almost the same as what you're going to do after the church ceremony. You're going to cut a cake 
And as a couple, you'll be told, go feed your parents. As, as, as a newly married couple, that is your meal. That you're going to do that so symbolically, if you eat this first piece of meat from the sheep or the goat that's been slaughtered, it's almost the same. It's the lies of the devil. We need to be careful about that. So, if you have involved yourself in setting up your marriage in some of these things that I have shared, your marriage is based on a faulty foundation. If you participated in these ceremonies using chickens, sheep, or goats, or any other animal token as an offering, you are on faulty ground. Other areas that we have suffered, we've been victims, is premarital sex or pregnancy before marriage. When done to prove fidelity, so that if you love me, or let me know that she can give birth fast, or let me know that it can work fast before I marry her, before we marry. That lies from the devil. They will not earn a blessing from God. Premarital sex leading to abortion. Concealing illegitimate children from your spouse. Concealing the fact that you have buried previously and even divorced. You enter into a new relationship and you conceal such. You conceal barrenness or sterility. You conceal previous crime or imprisonment. You conceal hereditary diseases that you know run through your family or other terminal illnesses. Or you have actually lied to your spouse, whether I have mentioned it or not. You have lied and you have concealed falsehood in order to manipulate that spouse or one into marrying you. That is actually manipulation, which is a spirit of witchcraft. We are witches and we are witch doctors, married together. That's what that marriage is made of. And finally, there are cases of plain disobedience in marrying an unbeliever or one whose religious beliefs do not agree with the Christian faith. You have a faulty marriage foundation. And for sure, any marriage built on a faulty foundation will not grow into a healthy marriage. Without help, it eventually collapses. So if your marriage suffers from this, how do you go about destroying these evil foundations? You need to repent. You really need to repent. But even before that, you need to reevaluate um, the generational foundation upon which your family is built. This then will demand strenuous effort in investigating the background and going backwards to establish the foundations. Secondly, being true, being true to yourself, your heart being right, and therefore being able then to bring true repentance, genuine repentance for the things you and your spouse have done to reinforce these generational uh, sins. You will need to mention them one by now, one. Glossing over them may not be helpful. Then three, make restitution to your spouse for any lie or falsehood you perpetrated before or after the marriage. Then pray the prayer of deliverance. Probably you might need to look for your pastor or any ministry or counselor to help you pray this, bringing repentance and then breaking and destroying those very foundations and speaking restoration into your marriage. And then building a new family altar and finally consecrating your family or you, and your marriage upon this altar of prayer. But please be open so that after investigation you might establish that actually you had no marriage at all. Whatever you put together does not constitute into a marriage, either biblically or even under the laws of the land. So then you will need to get it right. And then I'll quickly mention some sins that lead to bondages. The most serious of it seems to be the sin of idolatry. Uh, Psalm 78, 58 to 64, and Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. 
Idolatry is any action that does not recognize God as God. Things like witchcraft, sorcery, divination, hypnotism, reading the stars to know your future, palm reading, tea leaf reading, occultism, human or animal sacrifice, ancestral festivals, dedications, and the list goes on. All those are idolatrous acts. And in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, God gives a very serious warning to those who practice idolatry. He says, if a person turns to mediums and wizards, playing the harlot after them, I will set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Please remember that when you practice idolatry, you set yourself in contest against God. You are putting yourself in a position to challenge God because God hates idolatry. It moves him to jealousy. He gets angry and even moves him to abhor his own inheritance. Read Psalm 106, chapter 36. It turns the face of God away from you. That's what happens when you engage in idolatry. And sometimes, perchance, you, you don't know. But uh, when you take demonic artifacts and put them in your house, that's idolatry. In fact, such are the artifacts that are known as familiar objects, and those then become the contact points of Satan and demons harassing your family and following you and knowing everything about your family. We are most often tricked as believers when we travel overseas or other places and we think i've been to this foreign place therefore i'll carry this souvenir home as an a sign that i traveled um, most times we don't get to find out what those things are and so we bring these demonic artifacts into our homes and we suffer the consequences i can relate to just a, a small story that a sister was sharing that uh, one night she's asleep in, in her house upstairs and she thinks she's hearing uh, music playing downstairs and people dancing. As she comes and checks, there's nothing. She goes back to bed. Moments later, she hears music and, 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 and the beat and people dancing. She comes down again, sees nothing, puts on lights, nothing. So she goes back, seeks and asks the Lord, what is going on? And the Lord says, look at your calendar. In the living room, up on the wall, was a calendar with some pictures and carvings and people dancing. That was an artifact inside her house. So she had to burn it up. So these accursed objects in your house will lead to disease, they lead to divorce, they lead to rebellion from children, they lead to arguments, they lead to accidents, they lead to oppression. And however much you command them demons to leave your house, they will not leave for as long as those objects are in your house. Tied to this are those sins that lead to curses. I mentioned earlier about Al Eli's sin in 1 Samuel chapter 3, 11 to 14. The Lord spoke against Eli's lineage because of his sin, because of that iniquity. So as believers, we remain quote, quote, curse proof for as long as we remain within the safety zone of God's word and the parameters that he has set for us. So sins like questioning the word of God. By the way, if you want to read more, check out, check out Deuteronomy chapter 27. It has a list of them. But when you question the word of God or you deny the word of God, you've opened yourself to a curse. When you curse or mistreat the Jews, Genesis chapter 12 is very clear, you've opened yourself to a curse. When you disobey the Lord's commands, you've opened yourself to a curse. When ministers of the word fail to give the glory due to the Lord, to God Almighty, we open ourselves to a curse. If you're robbing God of tithes, you've opened yourself to a curse. Things like incest, Incestuous relationships within the family, we open ourselves to a curse. So sometimes it is not the devil. It is us walking in disobedience to the word of God. 
So let's look at deliverance, dealing with faulty foundations and bondages. The first aspect will be knowledge. You need to know that something is wrong. And then you need to know what is actually wrong. And then you need to know how that wrong or problem came about. The Bible says that through knowledge the righteous will be delivered. Proverbs 11, 9b. That is why we are saying earlier you will need to reevaluate the generational foundation upon which your family is built. So a thorough research of your genealogy will be necessary. The price of everyone's deliverance is in seeking knowledge. You have to know it's the truth. It is the knowledge, it's the truth that you know that makes one free. John chapter 8 verse 32. So because the issues of bondage are hidden secrets, they are hidden, they are not easily discernible, then you'll have to find that knowledge and use it. Secondly, examine your heart. Set your heart to a frame of repentance. An unrepentant heart, it tends to suffer from the cover of darkness. It rationalizes offenses, defends and justifies iniquity. It's incapable of genuine sorrow. An unrepentant heart manifests pride and arrogance and it is pretentious. It's insensitive. And when it is confronted with wrong, it counter accuses. And occasionally it will repent in half measure and does not allow a good seed to germinate in it. Repentance is key. Repentance will help deliverance in the following ways. It restores you, it restores one to a place of good standing with God. It helps us to submit to God. Secondly, repentance restores the authority of the believer to bind the devil. Thirdly, it breaks the legal hold Satan has over your life. It weakens his satanic hold and position over you. And then, for many cases of captivity, the sin opens the door to the devil. So, when that happens, repentance will break, will close those doors. Repentance prepares the ground for a time of refreshing and restoration of what is lost in the captivity. Then it opens a door for mercy so that you do not get punishment. We do not get punished for the sins that we deserve. It also helps you see what you have lost in God's purpose for you. And then it opens the gates of righteousness. So, knowledge, confession or repentance. Confess the sins. Name them one by one. Agree with God that you have sinned. Then confession removes all the justification of sin and removes all the excuses that you have. It allows us to expose sin. And when you expose it, then God can deal with us and forgive us. And then next you'll be, you renounce. Give up, surrender all those uh, beliefs and practices that have been helping the enemy to keep you uh, captive. Then revoke, revoke every repeal and now withdraw, cancel everything that uh, has given the devil the license over you. If you have those uh, uh, tokens or artifacts in your house, gather them and burn. Destroy um, the foundations now that have been faulty and ungodly um, uproot, tear, destroy according to Jeremiah 1.10 uh, and overthrow all those evil foundations and then follow with breaking every curse and, and, and rebuke any supervising spirit that has been raised to watch over those bondages and curses to enforce them in your life and then pray restoring what has been lost through oppression followed by closing every gate that has been open that the enemy has been using to come in to hold you captive then rededicate your life to the lord jesus christ and after that please purpose to live in victory gaining that victory and maintaining it is dependent upon you knowing who you are 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has already prepared a way of escape for us because the Lord Jesus Christ became a curse for us. He has put a wall of protection around us and there's no way the devil can come in to harm us. An undeserved curse will not land on you for as long as you do not open these doors again to satanic bondages. So you will need to know who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a child of God, a joint heir with Christ, a temple of God, chosen by God. All these things, Ephesians chapter 1 has a number of them. Study them, ingest them, make them a part of your life. And then now that you are free, please do not go back to those things again. Turn away from them. If it is something that requires you to make restitution, go ahead and do it. And then build a new altar of prayer and righteousness. Consecrate your life wholly to the Lord. Let your home, office, and place, or any other place, be you, you, a new altar, raise an altar in your office, at home, wherever you are, altar of prayer and devotion unto God. Then rededicate everything pertaining to your life and property back to God. Present to him as a vessel of honor and then make a vow never, ever to rebuild the foundations you have destroyed. Once you have earned your victory, it becomes an act of faith. Maintaining the victory, living the victory, becomes an act of faith. He has done it. He has done it. So you receive it and you lay hold of it and you walk in it. Satan will take advantage of your lack of faith. And he'll come back to his stronghold if you allow him to. So, believe that he has accomplished his purpose in you. Receive the victory and walk and live like one who has the victory. Do not lead life using yesterday's parameters and understandings. He has delivered you. He has set you free. Walk in that freedom. And persistently resist the devil and he will flee from you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord grant you the victory. And may the Lord use you for his purposes. Amen. <music>